Welcome back to Your 1230, the only podcast where our guests tell their story with the help of 12 questions in just 30 minutes. I'm your host, Mike Salitro, and today we are very, very excited to be speaking with Kathleen Selmans. Kathleen is on a mission to help solo service providers add an additional $100,000 to their business in less than a year. She's been working online for over a decade, and her superpower is the ability to see revenue gaps in other people's businesses and give them the tools to help fill them. Kathleen, welcome. We're really excited to talk to you. Thanks so much. Happy to be here. Excellent. And I want to start with that superpower. How did you discover it? How do you discover any superpower? You just, it just sort of shows up. Um, And I found, you know, I've been doing this, I've been working online for over a decade. So a really, really long time in internet years. And so I found that I could look at a friend's business and say, you know, if you just added this or tweaked your offer to that, and if the people who listened to me made more money and I found, like, I thought, you know, all this seems really obvious to me, um, but it's clearly not obvious or they would be already doing it because the, usually it's low hanging fruit that I find that, you know, have you, have you thought about this as a lead magnet or have you thought about this as a, a parallel offer where you can do the similar things, but get paid more money. And, um, or have you, have you thought about, uh, productizing, you know, so that's, that's sort of where it came from. And then I realized I can, I can help a lot more people than just the people whose whose worlds I'm in already. Okay, and if I could just follow up, that's it, it's really interesting to me for a couple of reasons. One, I think the main interesting part about it is that um, for those of us that run businesses, sometimes it's really hard for us to see the things that people for that aren't in it day to day can see. And two, sometimes uh, there can be the "What do you mean? Of course, I know my business." I how could I be missing anything or kind of that feel of control or the almost embarrassment that, oh, I probably should have saw that. I can't admit that there's this low hanging fruit out there. Uh, so how how do you kind of navigate both of those things? Well, the analogy I'd like to use is wine. So you're the wine inside your bottle, right? You know, not only what varietal or what mix you you are, you know, the specific gravity, the alcohol content, um, what row in the vineyard each grape came from, but you don't know what your label looks like. You don't know um, whether you're at the bottom shelf at a gas station or locked up high in a fancy wine room. All you can do is look at the other labels around you and hope for context. Um, and so when we talk about um, like the shame associated with it, there's no shame in knowing everything about your wine. You just sometimes need somebody to say, bro, you need to change your label a teeny tiny bit. I know you can't see it because you're inside the bottle. You just can't see it from inside the bottle. That's a wonderful visual. Thank you for uh, thank you for providing that. Uh, so. How does working with you start or what does it look like? Is it is it a one-on-one engagement? Are these friends that you're working with? Are these clients? You, know, you mentioned over a decade, which, which can be a long time in some circles. Uh, how, do, how does that work and uh, how has that evolved over that time? Yeah, um, it is. M- most of the time it's... Um clients who become friends because what I have, what I offer is a, uh, it's a group program. So you join me for a year and you do get one-on-one, you can ask, you know, one-on-one questions. We have one-on-one sessions, but the value is surrounding yourself with other people who are trying to do the same thing. So let's all level up together. Let's all become well-paid experts together. And, um, and then learning from the group, I have found You know, I started doing the group thing sort of selfishly, like, man, if I can say this one time and five people can pay me, that seems better, right? But what I found is that not only is it that, but it's also people people who come in, come in from way different industries, offer very, very different perspectives. And so they, um, we all get better together with sort of, again, the same sort of thing where there's a whole bunch of other people in the room that can see your label and they can say like, Hey, if you added this as a, as a piece of your digital product, I think it'd do really well. 
Yeah. I mean, using that wine uh, analogy, it's, it's wonderful when you've got that group, it's like, well, this might work in, in this store or this, or this, uh, you know, this, uh, wine, uh, kind of model but when i was selling this instead at this location this worked how can we tweak it make it work for you so uh, i think that's great to get the community aspect going because there is the the ability to bounce the ideas off and there is also that uh, kind of unspoken accountability that it's like well you know everybody else has, has tried this I, I can try something different and we're going to come back together and be able to talk about it you also mentioned the uh, the phrase the well-paid expert where did that come from um so I, so I've been, I, I had just left, we, I, we just closed a, an agency with a business partner. Didn't, neither one of us wanted to use that brand anymore. I decided when we closed it to, to go back to my name, but my name is really hard to spell and say and type. And I thought, you know, as much as I don't mind being the face of my brand, because as solo entrepreneurs, we, we are, I need something people can say. Um, and so instead of, um, instead of, you, you know, teaching people how to say the name that I married into or how to spell it, I thought, you know, let's do, let's do something more aspirational. Let's, let's make everybody well-paid experts. And I looked and wellpaidexpert.com was taken, but the wellpaidexpert.com was not. And I thought, okay, it's mine. So there we go. Okay. Yep. <laughs> so being able to help others scale, grow, improve their business is, is quite a skill. Is that something that you've been able to apply for yourself? Has there been a learning curve there? Or how did how did how does one develop the ability to help others uh from from kind of the ground level? Where where were you starting first when you began over a decade ago? Yeah, that's a great question. Um I came into uh, the internet world through personal finance. I had written, I started writing a blog. I was blogging my way out of um, consumer debt. Um, and I found a really cool community full of other people who were also doing something similar. And then as we progressed and as the internet progressed, um, we found that that's a really great niche for money making opportunities. So it's full of affiliates. It's full of um, advertising opportunities. There's private networks. So we, um, at, like my my cohort, my friends and I, who all started around the same time, um, found ourselves like backing into really cool business ideas. And so um, once I, and this happens a lot in when you have, when you have a, when you start a blog for a purpose, like I'm going to lose a hundred pounds.com. Or, um, I was really interested in, in getting, becoming debt free. Once you hit that goal, you know, like I've lost a hundred pounds, can't lose a hundred more, you know, like I'll disappear. <laughs> um, it's hard to talk about. And it like, especially for like weight loss and personal finance, cause there's a lot of, a lot of shame associated with like how we got ourselves into that mess in the first place. And as a, as a growing, maturing human, I want to just move on. Like, I don't want to talk about consumer debt anymore. I'm done with that. That was past Kathleen. And so I found myself working. I, I ended up partnering with somebody who um, is a, was a financial advisor. And so had no up, upward limit to, to number of times they could talk about money. Um, could talk about money all day, every day. And so I joined with them to help them build a personal finance podcast. And once we got there, once we took it, and it was so fun, but what I found more fun was taking it from not like from negative revenue to mid six figures annually. And I realized like the more I care way more about those mechanics than I do about the spend less, earn more, invest the difference personal finance ecosystem. And so uh, I sold my shares back to my partners in 2018 and started doing m just direct marketing for other people who have great products that they need to get in front of bigger audiences. That's a great foundational story. Thank you for, for sharing that. And it kind of helps provide a little bit of uh, perspective of kind of where, where you were and how you've got to where you are today. Uh, we've talked about 
you know, what it is that you're helping your clients do is there, I want to go back to <laughs> certain wines, but I'm, I'm going to stay away. Uh, there are certain, <laughs> is there certain companies, skill sets, uh, you know, target market that you work with, or have you found that this um, kind of, this kind of approach can work with most, uh, most solo or, or single uh, entrepreneurs? Yeah, it's, I mean, yeah, solos for sure. It's usually the people that are drawn to what I'm offering are not yet burnt out, but they can like see it on the horizon, you know, um, because what we usually talk about are, are the main way, the, the main angle we, we talk about is adding a digital product. So you have a leveraged source of income. So freelance writers specifically, you know, how can, how can a freelance writer make a lot more money? Well, if they're paying paid market rate, then there's two options. One, just write more. But if any, if like, if anybody listening to this has, has just tried to write twice as much as they usually write, like, you know, it's not good. It's not, that's not really a solution. Um, and so the other option is to add a digital product. And, um, that's the one thing that helps a, a freelancer be able to take time off, um, you know, feel like they can call in sick and not lose money. Um, as long as you've got something leveraged, then you're not at the whim of client work all the time. So you've you've hit on it when you mentioned with being able to speak to a community of five as opposed to five individual conversations to so kind of scale up in who you're speaking to. When you talk about digital products, I think of apps, courses. What exactly are you, are, are those the types of things you're helping your clients do or where, where are they looking first for that instead of just, oh, just double your output? Right. Well, the other one is, um, oh, just create an online course. And they're like, okay, just that? Like, neat. So <laughs> if they, if, so what usually happens is, you know, what I tell people is like, if three people have asked you how to do something, that's something you need to make a note of because if there's three people coming to you being like, Hey, how did you do this one thing? Um, or how did you grow your business or how do you get your clients or how do you do your social media? You know, whatever, whatever people are asking you, those are really good places to start for thinking about a digital product. And so when we, when we, when we come at it from the perspective of like, what might people buy? then we avoid the problem of that it, it's pretty, I wouldn't say it's all the way unique to solos, but it's really like, it's a big problem for solos because when you are the inventor and the creator and the writer and the creative, and then you also have to sell it, what ends up happening is you do one of those things badly. You either put together a bad product or more likely to the people that are that that end up working with me, you have a great product, but then at, once you start thinking about selling it, you start looking at your place in the world and in, in the marketplace. And yeah, let's go back to the wine analogy because you see all these other labels and you're like, well, people can just drink anything else on this shelf. I don't need to help them. I don't, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to like have, make them like, I don't know what I would say to stand out. And so then what happens then is that it's a, you know, six month effort that just never sees the light of day. Um, and then the worst part is that, that, that then they go back to, to what they know, which is hustling for more clients. Um, and then getting closer to that burnout on the horizon, because they've just increased their client load and, and tried to turn, you know, tried to try to get more done in, in a single day. Um, and so, taking it from a, a sales and marketing perspective means we're not doing any of that work for free. We're not building anything until we know somebody might want it. So that's, that's an excellent example. And I would like to dig into that because I, I, you're absolutely right that especially with a startup, a solo, a new venture that someone is going to be doing more jobs than they are skilled to do that they are apt to do, that they are good at, and they are going to do something poorly. And when that is the sales and marketing piece, that's the easy answer to say, well, my product is so good. My service is so good. It'll make up for it. And I'm sure as you've seen, that rarely is the case. Um, so you kind of talked about ways to not go back to, oh, just create more work, create more uh, client uh, engagements. Uh, how how can you 
how are you helping someone first see that? Is it is it examples of past clients that you've worked with? Is it people in their space that are kind of doing what they're doing a little bit better, maybe further ahead of them as far as, as sales and numbers? Or what does that actually look like? Because I know um, that, that can be tough for somebody, again, who's went through the pain of creating this digital product. And now it's, you know, I, I put so much time into it. It's a great product, but no one's buying it. Uh, I don't know what to do. Right. Well, I like that question a lot more than I like the conclusion that's like, well, I guess digital products just don't work for me. <laughs> or like people don't want whatever it is. Like, yes, they do. The the info product world is like a billion, several billion dollar industry and it's not going anywhere. Um, especially for like agencies right now where they are, agencies are the first to feel the, the recession uh, start happening because people, clients will pull back, but what they're pulling back on is done for you work. What they aren't pulling back on is learning how to do that stuff themselves. So if they've hired a content marketing agency, they're pulling back, but then they're spending a decent amount of money learning how to do content marketing in-house because that's what happens in economic times of tightening is that there's still money in the budget but they want to spend that budget on um, educating their their internal staff. That's an excellent point. And as, as you were kind of talking through that, the the agencies feeling the, the the first recession, I kind of thought of the the inverse of that that solo who might be perhaps leaving an agency at a time, and they are really skilled at sales and marketing, but their product isn't as good. So do you ever come up to, hey, people are buying this, but the feedback is terrible. How, you know, what should I do here? Or is it, or is it more of, um, I need to have more eyeball. I need to get it to the right price point, the right audience and and need to, need to work on that side as opposed to, you know, we can sell stuff, but we're not really good at creating anything. So candidly, the people that work with me, don't have that problem. Okay. The people that are drawn to the well-paid expert are great. They create A plus work all the time and they don't do a good job selling it. Um, usually the people that are great at sales and marketing and don't have a good product aren't self-aware enough to know that their product's not very good. And so they just think, well, I'm great at selling this, um, but these people, they're not action takers or whatever, you know, like they, they're not getting the, the right because they didn't do X, Y, Z, you know, so the, they get, it's typically the expert's problem is that not the expertise. They're so good. If you've been working online for any amount of time, you're so good at what you do. You're so knowledgeable that one of the struggles that we are, one of the obstacles we overcome in our program is getting you to take a step back, right? What the expert's problem is, so you're in real estate. So you just, the more expertise you have, the more you just assume everybody knows market rates or even the definitions of things. And you think, well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do that. Or, or they, everybody knows that you should X, Y, Z on Instagram. You know, everybody doesn't know that, right? Like they just don't, if they did, they'd be doing it. And so what we tease out are like, what are the obvious things? What are the things that you think that you're not offended if somebody asks, but you're always surprised when somebody's asking that question. You're like, what? You don't know how to tie your shoes? Like you think of it that way. And I would like that to be, we're only halfway through, but as far as if it's one or two takeaways today, as far as what those low hanging uh, fruit may be, one, assuming that everybody knows is wrong, that if it is something that you know do well, there are there are a group of people, at least an individual or some that don't know it. And two, as you said, if three people have asked you, then there are 300, 3,000, whoever, whatever number that there is interested in that. So if you can uh, get it out there and ideally package it in a way that more people can uh, observe, obtain that information, that, that's where you want to be. So that's the, that's the two easy areas that, that I can see from our conversation that no, not everyone knows it. And if most people are asking you, more people have that same question. Um, changing gears a moment, we've talked about how the internet has changed over a period of time. Obviously, information is changing faster, getting more places quickly. What are some of the 
uh, bigger trends or trends that those of us who don't work uh, on sales and marketing online would not know that, you know, 10 years ago, this was the case, but, you know, factually it, it's not anymore. And as a consumer, you may not be aware of it. <laughs> 10 years ago, we all wrote our own copy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, I, I, this is one of those things where I'm already tired of hearing about the AI takeover because, because chat GPT has just thrown it all into the limelight. But most of us have been working with AI in some way for years now. Um, and, but, but at, at first we didn't know anything about any, anything. So in 10 years ago, the way to get on page one of Google was to write more crap than anyone else was writing. So the more the more 500 words, uh, keyword stuffed articles you had, the more likely you were to get on page one of Google. Or you could buy links. So in the personal finance industry, the people would come and say, I've got $10,000 um, for some online bingo thing. So I'm going to spend it on these 10 uh, personal finance sites and get these backlinks and then get on page one for some super high value keyword. So what, when, and then, you know, it was, that was a glitch. That was, a, it made the internet not as usable. It wasn't, it wasn't fun to use. It was a heyday for publishers, but it was, it was a loophole that got closed. I think to the benefit of the user, right? You don't want to have, you, you still find it every once in a while uh, when you're looking for like the best X, Y, Z something uh, and you find you're like, oh, this is, this is one of those. This is just like a keyword stuffed article, but you don't see it nearly as much as you did 10 years ago. No, you, you're, you're right on that. And, and you're pretty smart to bring up that the AI uh, kind of migration towards copy, for example, is what something that we have seen a little bit of and just seen it explode in the last, you know, six to 12 months, and it just can continue to do it. It's funny to see the reaction of some saying, well, that, that's not going to replace me. And I mean, that thinking is just wrong. And then others who are like, well, th I'll let this do all of my copy. And well, that's also wrong, because you, you know, you need to check it, you need to have some quality control in place. Uh, so I think that's a that's a good that's a good answer to that question. Uh, in the bio that I read up top, the two things that jumped out at me was the the figure, the hundred thousand dollars, and in a relatively short amount of time, a, a year. Um, and I think when we talked uh, prior to recording, we talked about yeah, you can sometimes find that in your Google Drive that you've got information again going back that people don't know, and some people are really interested in it, and they keep asking. You need to get it out there. Um, so for for those that and maybe are the beginning of their journey, how can they find that 100K on their Google Drive if it's something that they are thinking about and have been hesitant to take that first step? Two ways. One, teach your clients how to do what you do. So we we talked, we touched earlier on what happens during a recession. So let's say you're a web designer. You can teach your entire process. You can give it all away um, and you'll get people to buy your program and to go through it and still hire you because, because they don't realize how much work there is. And so, and, and you can teach every single piece of that without ever running the risk of, let's say you charge $10,000 for your web work and you would charge a thousand dollars for this course. That it's about the, the, ratios that kind of make sense. Um, so let's say you do that. Um, and then you want the, one of the hesitations that I see people get to is like, they've got this big, robust course, and then they have a client come in and they say, Hey, I need X, Y, Z. And then they think to themselves, well, I don't want to step over $10,000 to make a thousand. That doesn't make any sense. And so then that's another way courses die on the vine, because then they think, well, I'm not going to do that. But realizing taking a step back and realizing that the person that's going to take the time to learn how to design their own website is not the same person who's going to pay you 10 times that for you to do it your, the, yourself. The other piece that I would do 
if you're, if that does, if that sounds not like what you want to do, the other piece I would do is what advice would you give yourself? Let's say you started five years ago. What are the things that you know now that you didn't know five years ago that you, if you did know five years ago, you would be a lot farther along. That's, those are the two areas where I suggest every expert start because a lot of people are systems geniuses. I have a friend who just has a system for absolutely everything. And so her product is a bunch of processes that, that she can digitize and then use. And so, but people think, and then anything that you think you would ever use the word just in front of, oh, that's just my onboarding that gets people up to speed in a week. Oh, just come on. You know, so anything you're like, well, or like your industry, well, that's just stuff that people know. Well, not everybody knows it. So it, especially your industry, there's plenty of people. It's usually not the, the hours that it takes to become a licensed realtor that stops people from being successful. So how can, how can we teach those people? So it's, I, I don't know. Sometimes it's like, it feels like you're training your competition, but it doesn't have to feel that way. And it doesn't have to be that way. I want to, I want to get back to the, the giving it all away and training others. Cause that's an, another an excellent, excellent takeaway. But the advice give somebody five years ago, simplify it, get the feedback, let it break it, fix it and do it again. I think that that's the advice that I would certainly give myself. And that I, I often uh, most find others that it's way too complicated because you kind of think that, well, that's just, and you build something quote unquote, more sophisticated. And all you've done is make it more difficult for yourself and your potential end user. So you're certainly right about the give the advice for one, three, five, whenever you started years ago uh, to that user, because somebody wants to go on that journey and help them get there faster than you did. Uh, but I really want to ask you about the, the give it all away, because I am 100% in agreement with you on this, that this is the way to do it in this space uh, for one of three reasons. One, it's, you know, I come from a collaborative uh, mindset. I come from, you know, I would, if people can do it, let's do it. But generally one of three things happen that whoever is doing that in place of working with you or another professional, they probably can't, won't, or shouldn't uh, do it themselves. They buy and it's like, I'm not going to look at this. I don't have this 10 hours to go through this course. Or they start to and say, wow, this is a lot harder than I thought. I actually need somebody who can take me through these steps. Or they take it, they learn it. And it's like, you know, I should be doing what I'm my real job. I can make more money. I can help more people. I can have much better outcomes. If, if I do that, I need to have somebody do that. So by giving it all away, you're kind of giving, you know, most of the time it's like, this is what it's like to work with me. If you can do it great. I would love for you to do that. But most of the time it's going to be, I'd, I'd like to uh, invite you back in and, and help me help us do it together. So uh, complete agreement there. Uh, we are coming up on time somehow. Uh, I do want to ask where, if where could our listeners uh, connect with you, find you? Where's the best place for them to kind of learn more about what you're up to, and ultimately, uh, you know, get in touch with you if they'd like to? Yeah, I'm at the thewellpaidexpert.com. Okay, easy enough. So we will post that, uh, and we have covered a good a good amount of ground today. But is there anything that I didn't ask you that I probably should have? No, I don't think so. Okay. So we'll end here then. We spent uh, a good of a good amount of our time digging into what your day-to-day, -day, your professional background looks like. When you are not helping other people find the things that are easy for you to spot, what what are you doing to either relax or how are you maximizing your business if we want to go back professional? I'll give you I'll give you the option there. Well, actually, the answer it doesn't matter because whether you're asking on the business or the personal side, because the answer is the same. I very much limit the number of hours I'm sitting at my desk because if you are not, if you're new to working for yourself, it's very easy to just say, huh, well, I sleep eight hours. That gives me 16 to work. Let's do this. And again, you're going to burn out. You're going to hate it. You're, you're going to forget that this is why, like, you're going to easily forget why you started in the first place. And so for me, I make sure I'm, I'm on my yoga mat every day, at least once I try to get out 
side at least once. It's a little bit challenging sometimes in the year for me because sometimes it's 150 degrees here. So, <laughs> so I mean, not that hot, that hot, but it feels like it. Um, and, um, and then I have a hard stop in the afternoon when my kids get home from school so that I can be present during the day and then present with my family to remind myself why I'm working all this hard to begin with. No, I, I I love that answer. My question was awkward and well all over the place, but you gave another fantastic answer. So thank you for that, uh, and thank you for for today. This was uh, this was really helpful, and you've got wonderful advice. So Kathleen, thank you for joining us, uh, and I look forward to doing it again. Yeah, me too. Thanks so much.